Hello, and on behalf of the Advanced Renal Education Program and the Nephrology Campus, welcome to the third in a series of webinars entitled Choices in Hemodialysis, Variants, Personalized Therapy, and Application of Evidence-Based Medicine. My name is Professor Peter Stemmekel, and I'm a professor and senior lecturer at the Department of Renal Medicine at the Karolinska Institute at Stockholm. Sweden. And I will be your moderator for uh, this uh, session. I want to say a big thank to all of you healthcare workers as you continue to provide world class care to our patients. We have a large number of attendees today and all lines have been muted as a courtesy. We do, however, want you to engage with us during the program. So in the user panel, please feel free to submit your comments and questions at any time during the program. We have also included handouts of both the presentation and literature article, which will be discussed today. And if you have any additional questions after the webinar, please send an email to the respective region seen on this slide. We have a comprehensive webinar schedule, as you see here. Over the course of eight webinars, we will discuss articles from the supplement recently published in the Clinical Kidney Journal that was entitled The Duality of Dialysis Membranes, Their Attributes, and ramifications. And with these webinars, we aim to help facilitate better understanding of the functioning principles of hemodialysis with a focus on the critical role of the dialysis membranes. Be sure to register to attend when you receive the announcements via email. We will share upcoming dates later in the program. And our panelists today will be um, Dr. Stefano Stewart. Dr. Stewart supports the Fresenius Medical Care, Nephron Care, medical leadership in his role as a chief clinical officer for the EMEA region in the Global Medical Office. Dr. Stewart's distinguished career include a nearly a decade with Fresenius Medical Care in the clinical governance roles for the company's EMEA and Latin America program. He has served as a consultant director for nephrology and dialytic uh, dialysis departments in Italian public and private hospitals. Dr. Stewart received his PhD in nephrology from the University of Bologna in Italy and his doctor of medicine and surgery with a postgraduate diploma in nephrology from the University of Chieti in Italy. Dr. Stewart is an author of more than 150 scientific publications in peer reviewed journals, and his HISH index is 26. We are thrilled to have Dr. Stewart here today to present to us. Thank you for, um, uh, and, uh, and I, with this, I would like to uh, leave over to you, Dr. Stewart, to continue uh, and start your presentation. Thank you, Professor Stenwinkel, for your presentation, for your introduction. And uh, I would like to make a comment about this presentation. I think that is a very complex presentation because in one hour, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I have to summarize what we discover, what we are applying for patients in dialysis treatment in EMEA and also worldwide. So it's a very difficult presentation, I have to say. So already was mentioned that I am responsible for uh, the EMEA region and then cover the position of uh, chief clinical officer. And you see from here that the presentation uh, that I will uh, introduce to you is from uh, this article published recently on clinical and kidney journal in 2021. So the education program has been developed by the Medical Information and Education Office of the Fresenius Medical Care Global Medical Office. 
So, hemodialysis is a generic name that encompasses various kidney replacement treatment modalities that share an extracorporeal circuit, a device for fluid and solid exchange, and a solution to enable exchange between the blood and the fluid compartments. Here on the right, you see the first dialysis machine. So, the so called cold rotating drum dialyzer in 1943. So, around 80 years ago. And here on, on the bottom of the slide, you see the Fresenius uh, 6008 machine, that is a fully automized machine. So, you know, and you can understand which evolution we had in the last 80 years about dialysis machine and dialysis treatment. So, which is at the end of the story, the aim for each nephrologist, for each nurse, for each nurse working in a dialysis center to improve the clinical outcomes of dialysis patients. No story for that. But I would like to mention uh, two publications. The first one was published in 2009, and uh, the authors reviewed all the innovations in the, in the previous 20 years in the dialysis field. And they stated that at the end of this very intriguing publications that the optimal pre-dialysis care and time recreation of arteriosclerosis fistula are more effective and more economic strategy in the long-term outcome of dialysis patients. So it's a very depressive publication uh, for people working in dialysis uh, fields. But I have to say that also a very recent publication in 2021 uh, show that many interventions have been tested, but none of them or other intervention has clearly reduced or caused or cardiovascular mortality for patients on dialysis. So my aim in this presentation is to show to you that this is not completely true. So background, uh, what we are going to discuss in this presentation, the modality variance and their options, prescription personalization and optimization, and then application of principles of current evidence-based medicine in the dialysis field. So first point, modality variance. So you see here what are important. So mechanism and intensity of solute and fluid exchange, membrane specificity for the removal of solutes of different sites, range, treatment time and frequency, dialysis location and facility, selection of additional treatment options specific to patients' needs. So these are the modality variants. Mechanism of fluid and solid exchange. So you know very well what is hemodialysis. I would like also to introduce to you, mainly for, uh, for our US colleagues, hemofiltration and hemodiafiltration. So hemodialysis, you know very well, that relies on diffusive process that transports solutes according to their gradient concentration between the blood and dialysis fluid compartments. So the efficiency of dialysis of diffusion depends on size of the solids, molecular weight to be removed, membrane permeability features, blood and dialysate flow rate, and treatment time. So what is important also to mention that in hemodialysis, you have a transport of uh, solids or uremic toxin from the blood to dialysate, but also you have the transport in the other direction from dialysate to the blood of the patients according to what you would like to add to the blood of the patients. So how to measure the efficacy of and the performances of a diffusive dialysis treatment? So urea reduction rate, fractional solute removal, mass solute removal index, estimated glomerular filtration rate, KT over V, mainly urea, and standardized weekly KT over V, and then cis, mainly urea. But now, if we are moving from diffusive dialysis treatment to convective dialysis treatment, we should mention hemofiltration that, like hemodafiltration, relies on the process of convection. Removal of solids occurs as they are pulled along with the volume of the fluid transported across the membrane. So the magnitude of the transport depends on the hydraulic permeability, the saving properties of the membrane, 
the plasma solute concentration and treatment time or total ultrafiltrated volume. So which is the difference compared to hemodialysis? Uh, that hemofiltration, like hemodifiltration, is highly effective on, uh, for the removal of mainly large molecular weight compounds. But something has to be paid, and this that large volume of substitution fluid produced by online must be utilized. So hemodifiltration is an hybrid therapy and relies on dual process that combine diffusive removal by conventional hemodialysis and convective clearance hemofiltration in the same hemodializers. So hemodifiltration brings the best of the two modalities. And I would like also to mention that the safety of uh, microbial safety and of online production of substitution fluid are fully tested, published in many scientific uh, journals, and this is uh, today um, fully implemented in, in our country, so no problem for that, with one exception. So uh, I would like to mention also that what is really important to understand when we are performing a hemodialysis treatment, a hemofiltration or hemodefiltration, is to understand the selective elimination of the uremic toxin. In theory, we should simulate what is happening in the kidney. So in terms of uh, filtration fraction of the different toxins that are eliminated by the kidneys, in, real, in reality, by the dialysis treatment, this is not possible. We are only simulating what is happening in uh, native kidneys. So the semi-permeability function of dialysis membranes depends on their manufacturing process and determines which molecules pass through the membrane to dialysis, from the membranes to dialysis, and which are retained in the blood. The functions depend on the size of the molecules relative to the average size of the pores and uh, at the innermost separating region of the membranes. So you see here of what I'm referring. So they, this is the inner side of um, the capillars inside the dialyzers. And you see here the pores. So uh, according to the saving characteristic of the membranes, uh, we should classify in a very arbitrary way the membranes that normally are utilized during the dialysis treatment. But this is completely wrong. Anyway, in order to show to you uh, that the membranes, the dialyzer are classified in low, middle and high flux relating to the sieving potential of the membranes according to the molecular width size range of uremic toxins that are removed. But I insist, this is wrong. It's not to be, let me say, to be adopted. It's only to inform you. So which is the most famous um, toxins that, uh, sorry, that normally is evaluated in order to understand the sieving ability of the dialyzer? of different dialyzers. This is the beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, so normally, the old dialyzers should have a saving coefficient of uh, beta-2 microglobulin equal 1. But I would like to say that the risk is to remove also other substances that should be not removed. And I'm referring mainly to albumin. So what is really important to understand that more open the membrane pore structure, the greater is the probability of uncontrolled loss of useful substances from patient's blood. For example, I said albumin. And consequently, such as permeability to middle and higher molecules weight solutes precludes their use in hemodifiltration or in any modality with high membrane pressure stress. So about time and frequency, uh, it is well known that normally dialysis treatment should be performed three times per week, four hours in each dialysis treatment. But I would like to mention that this is not optimal for dialysis patients because the three thrice weekly schedule has for decades be considered unphysiological and a contributor to the side effects of dialysis for the patients. 
Why? Because the molecules, mainly the bigger molecules, are not removed in four hours. Also, I would like to say that for some patients, it's impossible to survive in a great clinical condition in a long interdated period. So three times per week is really supporting the efficiency in the structures, but it's not supporting the care for the patients. So consequently, uh, we can divide uh, the dialysis treatment uh, in three main categories, conventional hemodialysis. So as I said, three sessions per week, four hours each session, shorter uh, and or less frequent hemodialysis. And this is mainly dedicated for those patients that are starting an incremental dialysis process uh, treatment or those patients with residual kidney functions or longer and more frequent hemodialysis treatment, for example, four to six sessions per week or uh, with longer uh, treatment time between four and eight hours. And these are mainly for those patients that have to recover some clinical problems. But I insist, three times per week is not enough for dialysis patient. They should be increased to four dialysis treatment per week. I would like to mention that there is no any reason why the dialysis clinics should be closed on Sunday. So uh, uh, about treatment time and frequency, I would like also to mention that small molecules to be removed don't need a long uh, treatment time. Whereas for middle or large molecule, it's really important to increase the treatment time so it's not possible to remove these molecules in the same time that when urea is removed in only six, eight hours per week. Hemodialysis treatment schedules is always a compromise that should meet patient metabolic needs, patient's tolerance, patient's choice, and availability of in the healthcare system as a local care offering. Treatment location. Where to perform dialysis treatment? In center, home, and self-care unit. Since I'm speaking, I prefer home. Additional treatment option. Uh, if you want to perform a better dialysis treatment for the patients, we should adjust the dialysate electrolyte composition according to the patient characteristic mainly managing the sodium concentration that is eight, potassium concentration and calcium and magnesium. Sodium because we have to avoid the hypotensive episodes, the hemodynamic instability, the fluid overload of the patients. So this is very important. Potassium concentration because we have to avoid too fast changes in potassium and blood potassium concentration to the patients. And calcium and magnesium because we have to avoid the complications related to calcium phosphate metabolism management. Dialysate buffer, uh, you know very well that in order to restore uh, acidosis of dialysis patients, it's important to add uh, a buffer uh, to in the dialysate. Normally, what is utilized is bicarbonate because uh, bicarbonate must be not metabolized as well as, for example, citrate. So this is the most famous buffer, bicarbonate. And normally uh, the concentration of bicarbonate in the erisate range from 30 to 35. Anticoagulant agents, so sodium heparin, but with the risk of uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia type 2. So this is the reason why in many countries uh, is, are utilized the low molecular weight or fractionated heparin that reduce the risk of bleedings and also the risk of coagulation in the system. Or for some patients that are allergic to heparins, it's suggested to utilize not heparin forms of anticoagulation. For example, I was very surprised to see in Asia Pacific, in our clinics, and something that I discovered, patients that lies without heparin, um, but they will receive anti antiplatelet agents or oral anticoagulants, and they received um, 
resolution immodal filtration. So when hemodialysis treatment should start? Uh, technically, it's when the glomerular filtration rate is below 15 milliliters per minute. But I have to say that we should not take in consideration only the glomerular filtration rate, but also the clinical condition of the patients, because there are many complications related to the kidney insufficiency that should be treated. Anyway, uh, we should take in consideration fluid overload, so the clinical characteristic and condition of the patient. So fluid overload, congestive heart failure, hypertension, metabolic acidosis, electrolyte abnormalities, malnutrition, anorexia, and weight loss without no potential explanation as complication to immediately start the dialysis treatment without to take in consideration the glomerular filtration rate or the urine output. So here is summarized and, and very easy algorithm to understand what pre-dialysis patients should do when they are in the CKD5 phase. So first of all, it's really important that these patients are evaluated and treated by a well-prepared clinical staff. I'm referring to nephrologists and nurses. So in this phase, when they have to, to move to start the RSS treatment, I believe that patients should and the, the family members should be informed about other solutions to dialysis treatment. I'm, I'm referring to conservative care and palliative care, just in case patients are in very, very complex and difficult clinical conditions. So if at the end the decision is to start the renal replacement therapy, the patient should be informed about two possible solutions. So the first, and I think more important, is a preemptive kidney transplantation from uh, living donors. Then uh, we, the patient should be informed about the possibility to perform dialysis treatment at home, and I'm referring to peritoneal dialysis and home dialysis. And then the patients, once they are not in favor for home treatments for kidney transplantation, they should start hemodialysis in center with different uh, uh, options. I'm referring to hemodialysis, iflux dialysis, hemodefiltration, and also other options. So longer dialysis treatment, shorter dialysis treatment. So uh, during, um, when the patients are starting dialysis treatment, it's really important to adjust the dialysis characteristic the dialysis treatment according to the patient characteristics. So now I would like to show to you in the next slide what we are doing in EMEA Nefrocare, so Intracellulose Medical Care Europe and Middle East and Africa in order to support our physicians and our clinical staff to adopt specific uh, dialysis strategies for those patients starting the dialysis treatment in the second week uh, after the starting between the third and the fourth week uh, between the fifth week and uh, before the end of the third month, and then after the third month. You see here the dialysis characteristics and the dialysis procedures that we suggest to our clinical staff in order to adjust the dialysis treatment according to the patient characteristics. Surely, uh, we ask an adaptation of the dialysate electrolyte concentration according to the patient uh, clinical status. What is really important, uh, I believe, for, for, for us is not to rapidly correct the acidosis that the patients have. So it's not important to, to restore uh, the acid base uh, correct balancement in the first dialysis treatment. And also we suggest which are the blood testings that patients should do uh, during the different time periods uh, when they start the dialysis treatment. Also, it is really important to identify specific uh, medical care performance indicators to evaluate the dialysis delivered to the patients to understand the efficacy of the treatment delivered to the patients. And again, uh, we have 23 different medical care performance indicators in our organization, and you see these are related to evaluate the dialysis adequacy, the cardiovascular diseases, 
uh, the anemia, the mineral bone disorder, the nutrition and diabetic condition, and also the electrolytes. So uh, our clinical staff is fully aware when the patients are not reaching uh, our targets that are satisfying the international uh, guideline suggestion to better take care for the patients. So we have these 23 different medical care performance indicators. Important, uh, preservation of residual kidney function. Uh, I never understood why it's so important for peritoneal dialysis patients to protect the residual kidney function, and this is not important for dialysis, hemodialysis patients. This is absolutely wrong. Uh, the residual kidney function should be protected also for patients in hemodialysis treatment. And there are many different strategies in order to try to protect um, the residual kidney function in dial hemodialysis patients. So now we switch to the evidence-based medicine, and you know, I will also show to you what we implemented in my organization according to the evidence-based medicine. It is really important to, to show that the evidence-based medicine is according to three different pillars. So clinical expertise referring to physicians, patients' values and preferences referring to patients, and relevant scientific evidence. This is coming from scientific uh, study publications uh, and results. So evidence-based medicine applied to hemodialysis. So there are 10 different pillars that we should take in consideration. And you see here uh, which they are. Initiation of dialysis, vascular access, hemodialyzer, dialysate buffer, hemodialysis modality, hemodialysis adequacy, treatment time and frequency, ultra purity of dialysis fluid, practice pattern and quality assurance, and preservation of resident kidney function. These are absolutely really important uh, to manage the dialysis patients. So initiation of dialysis treatment. As I mentioned before, dialysis uh, start should be not be decided only on numbers of low glomerular filtration rate. Uh, physicians, nephrologists have to evaluate the patients according to their clinical condition and decide if it is the right time to start dialysis treatment for this patient. Should be really important that all patients starting the hemodialysis treatment should start with the right vascular access. And which are the right vascular access? No doubts. Fistula, arteriosvenous fistula is the vascular uh, access of choice. Then arteriosvenous graft. And then if it is not possible to deliver to the patients to create for the hemodialysis patients fistula, arterial venous fistula or graft, then uh, there are the central venous catheters or port catheter. What is really important is that vascular access monitoring and maintenance are crucial to prevent dysfunction and to reduce vascular access related morbidity. Hemodialyzer, membrane flux and biocompatibility. So, today I have to say that cellulosic membrane are almost disappeared we have still the modified, synthetically modified cellulosic membranes, but the most common uh, membranes in the market are the synthetic uh, polymer membranes, 70% of market share. I would like to mention that the high flux synthetic membranes should be the first choice for dialysis patients. Dialysate buffer. Uh, I insist uh, bicarbonate buffer dialysate should be the choice for dialysis patients because bicarbonate uh, is not metabolized. So whereas, for example, citrate is metabolized, must be metabolized in bicarbonate. Hemodialysis modality. So high flux hemodialysis today is present uh, in 60-70% uh, is utilized for 60-70% of hemodialysis patients worldwide. Hemodefiltration, online hemodefiltration is constantly increasing because it's well understood the efficacy and the benefits for dialysis patients to be realized by online hemodefiltration. 
Today in Europe and in Asia, the total number of patients receiving immunofiltration range between 12 and 24 percent. I'm also very proud to say to you that in EMEA organization, patients receiving, so in Fresenius Medical Care EMEA organization, patients receiving immunofiltration is around 62, 63 percent. So then, if someone will ask to you how to measure the adequacy in hemodialysis adequacy in dialysis patients, I hope that nobody will answer evaluating the KT over B, because this is absolutely a wrong answer. So you see here how many uh, different factors should be evaluated in dialysis patients to understand the adequacy of dialysis treatment delivered. So I will show you some examples now. So first of all, dialysis adequacy does mean that the patient should be symptom free, feeling well and maintaining usual functionalities and lifestyle related activities. This is really important. We are not treating numbers in dialysis clinics. We are treating patients. Second, fluid volume control, blood pressure control and hemodynamic stability. We have to avoid intradialytic apotensive episodes. Absolutely, this is a mandatory. And now we can manage, how we can reduce the uh, intradialytic apotensive episodes. First of all, to be better managing the fluid status of the patients, avoiding uh, fluid overload, and also uh, avoiding a uh, uh, high rate of ultrafiltration rate. We should avoid high blood pressure in dialysis patients, but which is the right value of blood pressure in dialysis population? It is not really well known. And as I said, we should avoid high ultrafiltration rate in dialysis patients. And now we should avoid educating the patients to reduce the sodium intake, uh, maybe increasing the treatment time, maybe increasing also the number of dialysis treatments per week. As I said, there is no reason why the dialysis center should be closed on Sunday. And here is a recent publication that we published in uh, the Journal of American Society of Nephrology showing how much the fluid overload impact the hazard ratio, so the mortality risk in dialysis patients in the three different categories of patients with three different uh, blood pressure uh, targets. So you see that with low blood pressure below 130, normal blood pressure 130, 160, and high blood pressure higher than 160, the impact of fluid overload, so overload status, is on uh, mortality risk compared to normal hydrated patients. So it's not important, it's not really important the blood pressure, it's more important the fluid status or, and to avoid the uh, fluid overload. And here is an example of what we are doing in Fresenius Medical Care EMEA. These are patients in target for hydration status. You see that we started in uh, um, 2010, and you see the evolution different April of the different, sorry, in April of the different years. So the yellow bar are representing uh, April in different years. And today, in April 2022, 70.6% of patients are in target for hydration status we consider missing data as negative score. So you see for a hemodynamic status, fluid removal, so I'm referring to ultrafiltration rate below equal 13 milliliters per hour per kilo, and we have 93% of patients in target. And you see the evolution of pre hemodialysis historic blood pressure in the last 12 years. So in 2010, we had 49.6% of patients with this pre-dialysis uh, blood pressure values between 130 and 160, and today we have 60.2. So this does mean that slowly we increase the pre-dialysis historic uh, blood pressure. Dialysis dose control, uh, as I said, small molecules, removal, uh, small molecules normally are evaluated by KT over V, for middle or large molecules, uh, I'm referring maybe to beta-2 microglobulin, or maybe we are also evaluating circulating levels of biomarkers of interest. And for uh, those patients dialyzed by uh, hemodefiltration, we are evaluating 
the total ultra filtrated volume that is the sum of infusion volume delivered by hemodefiltration and the ultra filtration so the removal of the interdilated weight gain and you see here what we are doing in terms of dialysis dose control so first of all we are interested to understand the percentage of patients in target for fistula and graft but also we are taking care for treatment time it is not possible to reduce the treatment time in dialysis patients nevertheless the kt over v is higher than 1.4 because as i said bigger molecules are not removed in the same time frame of small molecules as urea and you see here what we are also evaluating for those patients in hemodialysis blood volume processed and also for those patients in uh, therapy with hemodefiltration infusion volume and here as the reference targets that we are following Acid-based control, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, it is mandatory to restore uh, the acidosis of uh, the acid patients delivering bicarbonates to the patient. So serum bicarbonate correction is ensured by buffering and adjusting the dialysate sodium bicarbonate concentration to the patient's needs. And do you think that this is easy? I think that this is one of the most difficult activity that the clinical staff uh, uh, has to take care in the ICS centers. I give you an example. So I will not show, I will not go in detail, but these are the rules that we implemented in order to take under control uh, the acid-based metabolism management in the ICS patients. So complex rules, uh, and it's important to have a great expertise. And also you see here what we are managing in terms of acid-based control, potassium, bicarbonate, and also sodium. Again, phosphate, calcium, and bone disease metabolism control. Phosphate that is removed uh, in a longer period uh, uh, compared to urea. So we have to deliver more treatment time to the patients to remove phosphate. We have to uh, educate the patients to reduce uh, the protein intake and also to be compliant with phosphate binders. Calcium bone metabolism relies on positive calcium mass balance, but without to exaggerate due to the increased risk of vascular calcifications. And again, these are uh, patients in target for phosphate in our organization for calcium and also for a PTH. I have to say that in international guidelines is not clearly reported what to do with those patients with hypoparathyroidism. It's well defined what to do with patients with hyperparathyroidism, less with patients with hypoparathyroidism. And this is a growing issue that we are evaluating, analyzing in, in our dialysis population. Nutritional status control, we have different possibility to evaluate the nutritional status. I would like to mention here a clinical subjective global assessment, dietary survey, somatic protein concentration, so I'm referring mainly to albumin and instrumental measures. And what we are doing in an organization, you see here. Albumin, lean tissue index, that is a parameter that is evaluated by the body composition monitor. Also for uh, patients with diabetic disease, we are evaluating the hemoglobin glycated and also, but this is not really applied in all countries, the normalized protein catabolic rate. Anemia. Anemia is another incredible issue. And it's another incredible complication of uh, the uremic disease that must be corrected and must be corrected, uh, delivering the right amount of erythropoietin. So I'm referring to erythropoietic stimulating agents. But this is not the only strategy because in order to correct anemia management, the anemia disease or the anemia complication, we should also deliver the right dialysis dose. We should save the blood of the patients during each dialysis treatment. We should understand the nutritional support of the patients. We should prevent inflammation. We should uh, deliver the right amount of iron. And also we should avoid 
fluid overload. So these are the most important parameters that must be corrected in order to uh, correct the anemia complications. But I would like to mention that an important aspect is to avoid uh, the chronic inflammation of the patients. And it is strongly suggested to evaluate the C-reactive protein in order to understand if the patients are inflamed. And again, this is what we are doing in our organization uh, in order to better understand the anemia management and our performances. Hemoglobin, patients in target, erythropoietin resistant index, ferritin between 200 and 800, and C-reactive protein. And you see the evolution now of patients in target. Health-related quality of life. Uh, so I insist, we cannot treat numbers we should we are treating in our clinics patients and we have to take care for their quality of life for what we are responsible treatment time and frequency i already touched on this topic so uh, dialysis treatment delivered thrice per weekly three four hours uh three four hours per treatment absolutely is not enough is absolutely not. It's a, a compromise. We should look for a better uh, treatment time and frequency for our dialysis patients. The bottleneck, I have to say, uh, is the reimbursement rate that we obtain from the different countries. Ultra purity of dialysis, dialysis fluid. Uh, I would like only to mention here that the regular use of ultra pure dialysis fluid in hemodialysis and immunodefiltration is associated with a significant reduction in inflammation markers and, provide, and provides clinical benefits. Dialysis fluid ultra purity is strongly recommended in most guidelines. So, practice patterns and quality assurance. Uh, Already the DOPS presented uh, the great improvement uh, applying the right quality assurances and the right practices. Uh, I would like to, to show to you what we are doing in uh, Fresenius Medical Care EMEA. So first of all, this is a benchmark of July starting from 2000, uh, starting since 2010 to 2019, in terms of patients in target for the different K performance indicators. And you see the double digit improvements that we obtain for each medical K performance indicators. These are uh, the intermediate final outcomes, but what is happening to the patients in terms of final outcomes? And I will explain this slide. So without the implementation of our governance system that is called medical patient review with the evaluation of the uh, key performance indicators that you saw just before, these were the number of days of hospitalization per patient year. But with the implementation of the medical patient review, we reduce to this value the number of days of hospitalization per year. Here you see the saving for the different uh, national health system in uh, the different countries in Europe, so 100 million of euro. And here you see the increased revenue that we obtain in an organization reducing the hospitalization rate. What I would like to say here, that this is a perfect value according to the Porter formula. So we satisfy all the stakeholders. And also in terms of hospitalization, in terms of mortality, by the application of our governance system and our quality assurance, it's called medical patient review, you see that we were able to reduce the mortality rate in dialysis population. So you see that we reached a peak in September 2015 of 10.8. And in, before the starting of the COVID pandemic crisis, this value was 9.3. But we were able to publish this data stating that uh, by the implementation of digital transformation and by the implementation of quality insurance program called medical patients review, we were able to reduce the mortality uh, in our dice population of 30%. And this is in conflict, absolute in conflict with the two manuscripts that I presented at the beginning of my presentation. 
So finally, I said preservation of residual kidney function is absolutely a very important topic. And I have to say that this is a job for very experienced nephrologists and very experienced physicians. And I would like also to mention that normally the residual kidney function could be included in the standardized KT over B formula. And I would like also to say that a standardized KT over V should be equal to two or higher uh, than 2.2. And this value is exactly the same to an equivalent uh, trice weekly schedule with uh, single pool KT over V equal to 1.4 or equilibrated KT over V equal to 1.2. So after this long presentation, I am on the conclusion. Uh, hemodialysis, a kidney uh, and kidney uh, um, functions, sorry, sorry uh, hemodialysis and have changed, have changed over the last five years. Uh, hemodialysis therapy has incrementally adapted to the growing body of scientific findings, uh, to changes in patients' medical profiles and their uh, lifestyle-related needs by implementing highly effective and safe technologies and by improving medical practice. Currently, practitioners are at the stage of delivering more personalized dialysis treatment in a more patient-centered care approach by including various patient dimensions. And I would like to mention these points now because I believe that are very, very important. We know very well that one size fits all does not work for dialysis patients. So it's not possible to prescribe the same treatment, the same uh, time, the same frequency, the same dialyzer to our patients. So dialysis treatment should be customized according to the clinical condition uh, of uh, the patients. And also I would like to, to mention that dialysis treatment is something more than a process, a simple process. I would like to say that mm, the human dimension of the patient's doctor interaction is is so important, it's absolutely important. I'm referring not only the interaction between uh, physicians and patients, but to the nurses and mm -hmm. patients. So KT over V should be changed where T is the treatment, is the time that the clinical staff is spending together with the patients. The highly complex and multifactorial nature of CKD and this treatment require the judgment of experienced physicians to adjust and personalize prescription based on individual patients' needs. And finally, despite technological advancement in the future, we strongly, and I strongly believe, kidney medicine should be, continue to remain more of an art rather than uh, just a science. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to thank you so much, Stefano, for this excellent um, presentation. And um, there is now uh, time for uh, you to ask your questions. We had the chat. So please take the opportunity to ask uh, one of the uh, most uh, well-known uh, 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 dialysis uh, doctors in the area and uh, get uh, some answers. Uh, meanwhile, I can maybe start um, asking um, some questions to you, Stefano. Uh, and I personally believe that preservation of residual kidney function is absolutely one of the most important tasks for um, dialysis doctors. So what is your personal position on preservation of residual kidney function in hemodialysis patients? How can we achieve this? <sighs> adopting all the strategies that nephrologists have understood and studied for CKD patients. So I would like to mention that should be avoided in intradality complications, hypotensive episodes should be adopted the right biocompatibility uh, dialyzers should be adopted the right treatments for the patient should increase the treatment time. So preserve the residual renal kidney function 
the self sorry the renal kidney function is so important i insist i've never understood why it's so important for peritoneal dialysis patients and is less important for hemodialysis patients so why the physicians are not taking care for uh, the kidney function in hemodialysis patients we have mathematical formulas to understand what to do uh we can do we can apply all the strategies to better take care for the kidneys of our patients so uh, really i don't understand i would like to implement as medical care performance indicator when it is possible uh preservation of uh kidney function this is a job for nephrologist i have to say uh, so you stated that one size does not fit all and i completely agree are you aware of any studies or data indicating that we should uh, provide dialysis differently between males and females if sex has an importance? Or are, are there differences in, in gender here that could uh, be of importance how we prescribe dialysis? Uh, that is a very intriguing question. Today, the only customization that we have done according to the gender is related to the fluid status management that is different in male and in female uh, but you're absolutely right should we change the dialysis prescription according to the gender I, i'm convinced yes absolutely yes absolutely yes so we should change how we are prescribing dialysis treatment according to the gender yeah I think this is something that really needs some more studies, uh, the impact of, of uh, sex and gender on the, on outcomes in the dialysis. So now I received um, a question in the chat. Uh, I am seeing when a dialysis patient is admitted to hospital that the MD is dialyzing them every day. Is this because they feel that a typical three to four hours, three times a week has not been uh, sufficient? No, because it's a risky to restore the clinical condition of the patients uh, in a short time period. So soft dialysis is really mandatory for these patients. As I said just before, why to restore the acid-base condition in the first dialysis treatment to dialysis patients? How many complications we re so related to hypokalemia in those patients starting the first dialysis treatment? So, and I have to say that I saw, really I saw uh, with my eyes, a patient starting the first dialysis treatment with an hemodial filtration with the same intensity delivered to the patients that was no more incident, but is prevalent. So why to, risk, why to deliver this hemodial filtration with this intensity to a very fragile patient? There is no reason. So I insist patients should be treated according to their clinical condition, according to their abnormalities, and not because the science is teaching to all the nephrologists, you must do this for these patients. No, you have to evaluate the patients and understand the clinical condition. Great. Another question. Do you think also adjustment to size, uh, maybe body size is what is meant here, is one of the of the not so considered issues in the clinical practice? And do you think adjustments also considering the dialyzer size is uh, essential? Uh, that is a very intriguing question because I had a discussion with Bernard Cano about the convective volume to, to be delivered to the patients. So, and normally stated that should be delivered 23 liters of convective volume to the patients. But what to do with smaller patients? 23 liters should be the same also for them. And in the convinced study, it's adopted a formula in order to adjust the convective volume according to the body mass index of the patient. So uh, I fully agree that the resistance should be adjusted. But I would like also to mention that body mass index is not impacting the clearances of middle molecules. So I'm referring to phosphate. So if you want to remove, if you want to remove phosphate, we should deliver the right treatment time to the patients and not to reduce the treatment time in smaller patients. Um, here is another question for you, uh, Stefano. Which will be a future ecosystem of dialysis care and technology to support the transformative outcome? 
Green dialysis, green dialysis, less electricity, uh, less waste, and less water. So uh, I have to say that in, in Fresenius Medical Care, EMEA, in the section of balance court card, I believe that is since seven years or eight, eight years that we are evaluating our clinics according to these three parameters. So electricity consumption, water consumption, and most. So I'm very proud to say that we have this information. We are working on this information. And I would like to mention that also Charles so some years ago published then this green dialysis activities in uh, in the French uh, nephrocard dialysis centers. So what about the plastics? Um, that is a lot of plastics generated in dialysis. And I was uh, very intrigued by a recent paper in Nature showing that there is now an uh, possibility to use some uh, enzymatic system to break down plastics within 48 hours. It just um, seemed unreal when I saw this uh, article and the figures how, how plastic can be degraded. Is that something that could be considered also to reduce the plastic burden in on our planet? Absolutely, but I have not the idea about cost related to produce these devices with this type of plastics. I, w I was afraid that you was thinking to reuse the materials in order yeah. to reduce the plastic consumption, but we should not do that for the patients. No. So what do you think will be the most important transformation in the next, uh, let's see, uh, 10 years? Listen, uh, I am very impressed by the, the number of applications that I have on my iPhone that is fully customized according to my needs, my, what I have to do. So we have an incredible number of data, a big database related to dialysis patients. So digitalization is the innovation, the strong innovation for dialysis patients. And also we have to think that how to use the data that are in these big databases. And I'm referring to the advanced analytics. So thinking to diagnostic analytics, the script, sorry, descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytic, uh, prognostic analytics, and uh, prescriptive analytics. So I'm thinking how much physicians have to think about the right prescription for specific patients and how much the artificial intelligence can support these physicians, can be the right navigator in order to suggest to these physicians the right prescription. But I insist, uh, our medical activities is more an art and advanced analytics models could support this art, but will never substitute our physicians and their arts with their dialysis patients. Okay, I see time is running uh, quick. And uh, I, again, I, I really like to thank you, Stefano, for an excellent presentation. Before we end, I like to uh, just remind you that we can meet again, or we should meet again uh, within one week, uh, June 14th. Dr. Madhukar Misra will uh, uh, discuss and present to you uh, with the title Flamoxed by Flux, the Intermediate Principles of Hemodialysis. And I think this should be very exciting. And after we all have had a well-deserved summer vacation, we meet again and that uh, we do September 13, when Professor Alberto uh, Ortiz from Madrid will uh, present to you about hemoincompatibility in hemodialysis, alleviating inflammation and anticoagulation. So I myself look very much forward to these two uh, webinars and I hope to see you all then. And with this, I'd like to thank you for um, uh, joining us. And uh, wherever you are in the world, um, uh, some, for some of you, it will be a uh, good morning or for some of you, a good afternoon. And for some of you, it will be a good evening and hope to see you next week. Bye bye.